Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Prostate Cancer Lab, and we're very honored to have Dr. Robert Nagurney with us today. Uh, Dr. Nagurney has extensive experience in chemosensitivity training, uh, uh, functional testing. We were introduced by to Dr. Nagurney, in particular by Dr. John Laird, who's here. John is a uh, concierge doctor who helps uh, various cancer patients in their disease. Um, Dr. Laird, do you want to do an introduction to Dr. Nagurney or just say a few words before we get started? Thank you. I really wanted to because I wanted to say some, something positive about him that he'd never say about himself. Uh, he's very modest. Um, but when I'm as a medical advocate for patients, when there's a chance to ask um, Robert, to be on board, I feel like I'm bringing a world-class authority to the particular issues that he's working on. And it's very rare that you can access these people. Um, what's said ab about him behind his back is that in a world, in a room full of oncologists, Robert's typically the brightest one in the group. He would never say that, but that's what's said about him behind his back. But what I really appreciate is that um, his perspective is unique in that he's a laboratory scientist delivering laboratory services, but he's also a practicing clinician. So he, he is very extremely experienced in translating lab values into how is it gonna work with this particular patient? And I think that's something we miss sometimes in the in the presentations here. We have someone who's only, you know, only research, only lab tech. Here's somebody who um, brings it both together. And um, the only other thing I'd say is um, he's very tough-minded, but deeply compassionate, always willing to help wherever he can, and very modest about um, what he offers. Uh, that's what I'd say. Are you blushing, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Joe. Okay, well, turn it over to you then, Robert. Uh... All right, well, thank you all for inviting me. Let me see if I can share my screen. That's working. Is it working for you? I'm not seeing it for some reason. No, it was it was showing uh, the full slide deck for a moment there, slide sorter, and now it's black. black. There, yeah, there's the full slide sorter. We're seeing there we go. All 30. Can you see it now? Yes. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, John, and thank you all for the kind invitation. By way of introduction, I am a practicing medical oncologist. Um, I'm very familiar with prostate cancer. My father had prostate cancer, very high grade Gleason 9 inoperable disease. And uh, when I helped diagnose my father, I realized that contemporary care at the time would not leave him with a very long survival. So I assumed his care, probably a very bad idea. In general, you shouldn't be your own family's doctor. But my father, um, with his high-grade disease under my care and very cautious care, lived 21 years and died of other causes. And so I became exceedingly interested in the cancer of the prostate from that experience and uh, began to look at it through a different lens. Uh, Robert Coffey who was probably the father of modern uh, biological research in this field from Johns Hopkins. So I think he's really a hero in the field. Coffee was very much interested in seeing that we dedicated the time, energy, and efforts to prostate that we were at the time only dedicating to breast and some other cancers. I'm um, a medical oncologist. I'm the director and founder of the Nagorni Cancer Institute, which is a subsidiary of Rational Therapeutics, my original laboratory group. We've been in existence and CLIA licensed for over 20 years. I'm a clinical associate professor at the University of California, Irvine, and the founder of several uh, biotech companies, most recently Metabolomics studying the field of human metabolism. I'm reminded in this field of a quote uh, from Alexander Pope, who said in 1733 that the proper study of mankind is man. And I said in the 80s that the proper study of human tumor is human tumor. 
For over a century, we've been told that cancer is a genetic disease that arises from mutations and that broken DNA gives rise to broken cells and that broken cells give rise to cancer. This is pretty it much- It connects via Wi-Fi and it would connect to your TV, you know? Sorry, what do you use now? I'm not sure what that is. Can everyone hear that? Or? I okay. did, but it's gone now, I believe. All right, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, okay. So basically, yeah, the idea is that we have been we have been pretty well told that cancer is a genetic disease, and we've therefore dedicated all of the resources, the two hundred billion dollars more or less, to studying DNA, transcriptomics, genomics, and to put this in perspective, in twenty twenty two, fully nineteen years after the sequence of the human genome, DNA technology has had virtually no impact on the five-year survival of human cancer. To put that in perspective, if you are diagnosed with metastatic cancer today, 2022, and you require therapy for your metastatic disease, your chance of surviving five years is no better than it would have been when my 1941 model, 40, 1955 model 41D Buick special rolled off the uh, assembly line. It's a rather daunting consideration. So the task that really have confronted over this period of time has been to come up with human models to study human cancer. We needed to create a clinically relevant laboratory model, correlate the findings with clinical outcomes, and apply these to developmental therapeutics. Well, it seems simple enough. I remember talking to Bill Haidt at the time, um, director of the Robert Wood Johnson Center, and he said he just recruited a guy who thought that they would just take a biopsy of tissue, study it, and figure out what drugs to give. Huh. Well, the idea here is there must have been a reason why we didn't apply this. And I think there really was. This image of Iguazu Falls, where Brazil is on your left and Argentina on your right, in the southernmost reaches of Brazil, is really the great divide that separated most good scientific efforts. On the one side were those people convinced since Rudolf Virchow of 1857 said that every cancer cell arises from another cancer cell. We were convinced that cancer was a disease of cell growth. Every cancer came from another cancer. So if we're gonna win this battle, we had to study cells in their growth phase. We had to propagate cells. We had to examine what stopped cell growth. And we developed a host of drugs that are basically birth control devices for cancer. Anyone reading the literature however, would realize that it is simply not working. So the question then becomes, is there a different way? And just almost by accident, I stumbled upon the idea of killing cells in vitro. What if you just simply ended their viability rather than their proliferative capacity? Based on that, I became interested in the idea that measuring cell death would be the endpoint of interest. So the functional profiling conceptual framework paradigm number one is program cell death. The process by which cells when injured, damaged, mutated, altered, commit a sort of harry carry leading to their death so that they eliminate themselves and do not propagate in the future as a potentially uh, a dangerous clone within the 30 trillion cells that make up our body. To test this hypothesis, I wanted a model. I wanted to see if I could assess how well this sort of phenomenon could be applied in clinical therapy. And that opportunity came with childhood leukemia. We took 49 children undergoing bone marrow aspirates. We took a small quantity of the aspirate, used density centrifugation to isolate the malignant blasts. And we expose these children's cells to dexamethasone. And one might wonder why dexamethasone. Well, every leukemia induction therapy uses a corticosteroid, whether it's prednisone or methylprednisolone or prednisolone or dexamethasone or cortisone. Every child with leukemia gets that. And the reason actually reported some years ago was that dexamethasone induces cell death in leukemic blasts. So it's an ideal probe for the biology of B-cell leukemias. So we took dexamethasone 
entered it into the test tube of these newly diagnosed children and prospectively evaluated what happened to them over years. Children who showed a very strong cell death signal were compared with children that showed very little cell death signal. Now, remember, these children were being, uh, were being managed by clinicians. I had nothing to do. I'm not a pediatric oncologist. So I was entirely watching from the outside. But I did have data from the fourth day after diagnosis telling me which children looked sensitive and which children looked resistant. And this was really the first test of this hypothesis that we could measure in the laboratory what caused cell death and if that cell death occurred, whether patients would get better accordingly. And here's the outcome <clears throat> going out 15 years of follow-up. Children who retained the capacity to respond to injury were virtually all in unmaintained continual remission going out 192 months, while children who did not show significant cytolysis in the first days of diagnosis were all dead by the end of the first 10 years. Pretty striking. I thought at the time this would lead to some attention. It didn't. The next opportunity, again in leukemia, since that was our original model, was when I was at the Scripps Institute in La Jolla. I was a fellow and a colleague had developed a new drug called chlorodeoxyadenosine, 2CDA. Dennis Carson, a very capable guy who I liked a lot, uh, said that he was going to use this drug in T cell lymphoma. I asked him why, and he said, well, because in cell lines, T cell versus B cell, CEM versus Dowdy and mold 4 he was convinced that this drug was more active in T cells. So I said, well, could I have a little bit? And Bruce Watson, who worked with him in the lab at Scripps, gave me a little quality. I started testing it against all sorts of things, CLL and AML and ALL. And lo and behold, I had a chance to test it against a patient with hairy cell leukemia, and it was absolutely uniformly effective. And so I reported that to my colleagues at Scripps Clinic, who dismissed it because they didn't like human tumor primary culture analyses. And I was so frustrated by that all that I left the Scripps Institute and went to UC Irvine where I remain. It turned out, however, that simple observation led to the cure of hairy cell. There isn't a patient in the world today who has hairy cell leukemia who doesn't get 2CDA. Interestingly, a corollary of that was my ability to show that that drug and that class of drugs was synergistic with alkylating agents. And I showed that, that those combinations could prove very effective. And then in fact, cyclophosphamide plus fludarabine, closely related to fludarabine, became the standard of care for CLL and low-grade lymphoma for 20 years, all predicated on a laboratory test we conducted in vitro. But since only 10% of cancers today are hematologic, we really needed a test that would work for the other 90% of patients who suffered from the more common solid tumors, colon and lung, breast and gastric, pancreatic and sarcoma. And so in order to do that, we needed to craft a new understanding of cancer biology that went beyond single cells bouncing around in the circulation. Leukemia cells are sort of independent contractors, the Uber drivers of cancer. No, we needed a corporate structure, an assembly line that featured all the characteristics of a human solid tumor. And so that was the birth some years ago of paradigm number two, functional profiling tumor biology as tumor ecology, the tumor in its native state. And to gut human solid tumors, we needed to go back and stop neatly disaggregating our cells into single cell suspensions, which we were tending to do. And we needed to learn to craft and create human three-dimensional tumors that would give us the features of human cancer that would predict outcomes in these more difficult solid tumors. We came to see this as tumor biology as tumor ecology. Surgical explants, and the term is explants, not propagated organoids, but explants. Tumor cells, vasculature, B and T cells, M2 macrophages, cytokines, growth factors, fibrostroma, cancer-associated fibroblasts, all of that gamish that goes into the forest 
of a cancer cell. Assay models must maintain cell cell, cell drama, cell vasculature, cell inflammatory cell signals if they are to accurately predict outcome in solid tumors. And that was a hard learned but valuable lesson. I'm reminded when I look at others going into this field today uh, of a, of a uh, concern more and more for me in some of the labs because they're basically wanting to do this. They want to look at human organoids. They want to look at three-dimensional cultures, but they want to craft them <clears throat> in their own image. They want to create enough tissue from a biopsy, a core biopsy, whatever, so that they can propagate cells into three dimensions. Now, I will grant you, and this goes back some years, that three dimensions better than two dimensions, but three dimensions of tumors that are propagated to that state, A, have left their normal state of relative quiescence and propagated, B, are no longer able to maintain the integrity of the three-dimensional structure. So I was thinking about this, and it reminded me of a, of a musical that, that um, came out in uh, 1996, the idea that we love this so much. I love you, you're perfect, now change. This was a musical that was uh, performed 5,008 times. And the idea behind it was that people in relationships liked each other so much they couldn't wait to change their spouse. And in the same way, we're all sort of changing our cancer to be in our own image instead of doing what it does. Now, as an example of this sort of approach, and this is particularly in some laboratories today, this is a real concern because what we're getting is tissues that are being manipulated so that they give you something that, do, that the physicians and researchers can work with. And I'm not against using three-dimensional organoids to do studies, but the problem is turning that back around to the patient. If a patient gives you a tissue sample, the patient is expecting you to give them back answers that reflect their biology, not the biology you created. So just as an exercise, anyone in the audience is welcome to do this. Think of a number. Pick a whole number between one and 10, add two, multiply by two, subtract two, divide by two, and then subtract your original number. For anyone who's gone through the exercise, your answer is one. And I know that going in because I started with what I was going to give you. And that's the problem with over manipulation of human cancer. If we fiddle with it too much, it's no longer reflective of human biology. It becomes laboratory scientist biology. So by subculturing, propagating, or amplifying human cancers, we find ourselves creating an entire new biology, laboratory three-dimensional organoids instead of human tissue. And in keeping with Halloween, I think the fear in this is that you create the birth of the Franken tumor you've now got something that is not really human, looks a little bit like a human, but doesn't behave like a human. And what you want really is to return to the native state of the human cancer so that you can study in all of its uh, complexity, the interacting features of a human tumor. When we examine cancer response to tissue culture, when we examine cancer cells under stress, whether it be cytotoxic drug or radiation or, or growth factor withdrawal, when we do so, we now realize, if we read the literature, that cancer cells don't have one way to respond. They don't simply die by apoptosis. They die by calcium-mediated or misfolded protein, ferroptotic, PARP-mediated, necroptotic, autophagic, paraptotic, and other mechanisms of death. So we must be cautious when we measure cell death that we measure the sum total of downstream events, not some aspect or one feature of cell death. An example is provided here. These are um, isolated three-dimensional explants from a woman with breast cancer. We must remember that we do not create human cancer. We observe human cancer. And we must have the humility to recognize that cancer biology is demonstrably more complex than even our best scientists' capabilities. This is an extremely complex interacting system with lots of moving parts. So when we 
study these phenomena, we must observe what the cells do, not manipulate them to do what we want them to do. So here we have a, a clusters to 75 or 100 cell clusters in their original state in three-dimensional studies. And when we expose these cells from a patient to the drug doxorubicin, this is a breast cancer, doxorubicin is widely used in this disease. When we expose these cells to doxorubicin, these cells decided how they would die. And as you can see in real time, some of the cells die by an apoptotic phenomenon and that's featured by a sort of cell shrinkage and, and, and uh, nuclear condensation and other features morphologically. And right within the same tissue culture, right at the exact same time under the same conditions of the same patient, some of the cells are undergoing a more necroptotic morphology. And then others are assuming a more autophagic feature, which may or may not result in their survival. So within the same patient under the same conditions, after being exposed to the same drugs, cells can die a lot of different ways. Now, having done a lot of work, in leukemias and published in the leukemia field for years, I really wanted to move to solid tumors. And so I was looking for a way to test these hypotheses in the solid tumor realm. I so happened to be at the American Association of Cancer Research one year, I was presenting some work, and I ran into a fellow by the name of Peter Tarasov, who was a senior scientist at the Eli Lilly Company. And we were talking because I was talking about, you know, chlorodeoxyadenosine and cytosine and rabinocyte kinetics. And I was very interested in anti-metabolites. And he said, well, gee, we've got this, we've got this new anti-metabolite. Turns out a guy named Larry Hurdle in the 80s had synthesized this as an antiviral. And it wasn't a particularly good antiviral drug, but it seemed to have some effects on human cancer, particularly lymphomas. So they switched over from the viral use of this new compound to the possibility of its role in human cancer. And I happened to meet Peter and we talked and I asked him if they would be kind enough to send me some drug, which they did. And I got a delivery of gemcitabine. And I gave Dr. Wanjon Su, my postdoc in the lab, I gave her the drug and I said, gee, uh, Dr. Su, um, here's a novel drug owned by Eli Lilly Company with no FDA approval or known disease target. Let's see what we can do with this stuff. So we began to study it and we put it into tissue culture and it was moderately active against a lot of diseases, not highly active against many other than leukemias, which would not be surprising. It's a deoxycytidine derivative. So, you know, difluorodeoxycytidine. So not surprisingly, it worked a little bit like RSC, its closest congener. However, that difluorogeminal substitution on the ribose ring was very interesting because it suddenly changed the dynamics of this drug and moved it from leukemia only to solid tumors if appropriately used. And our first fundamental observation was that when you combined this drug with other drugs, it could be extremely good. Here is a study we reported many years ago. The first 756 analyses, this was reported in a textbook on 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 uh, any metabolites. But here we showed that gemcitabine was highly synergistic with cisplatin. Now you've got to remember this drug was not yet FDA approved. It did not have an indication. No one was using it. Yet we already knew where it belonged and who to give it to and what to give it with entirely based on our laboratory human tissue studies, not cell lines, not genomics, human cancer. So we said, well, if gemcitabine is synergistic with platinum, what diseases might we use it with? And I got very interested in trying the Rive disease, and I'll show you some of the data. Now, again, this is before the drug had any FDA approvals. The first, reported in 2000, was gemcitabine plus cisplatin, repeating doublet therapy in previously treated relapsed breast cancer patients. It turns out that this drug could provide responses when combined with platinum, based on our laboratory studies, could provide responses in up to 50% of patients who had failed everything, even bone marrow transplants. In fact, the corollary to the studies when we reported them in JCO in 2000 was that this combination not only worked and not only could we get 
extremely good responses, so many durable responses. But we had the opportunity to show that in the laboratory, when we tested patients, we could show which ones would do better and which ones would do worse. So we had not only developed a treatment that is used today around the world, but we had the opportunity to prove the predictive validity of the laboratory model that found the combination. I thought at the time this would gain some traction. It didn't. So I said, well, let's move this to another disease. Once again, in the laboratory, cancer uh, therapy for a disease that was failing known treatments. So we put the same doublet together into ovarian cancer that had failed everything. Patients sometimes had up to 13th line therapy. And we conducted a pilot study with Dr. Philip Desai, a very close colleague here at Irvine. And we decided to take patients who had failed everything and gave them the same doublet. And once again, this laboratory developed combination before any FDA approval that allowed it to be used in patients, using it under investigation, not only did it provide profoundly deep and prolonged remissions, but we were again able to show in vitro that we could pick the winners and losers using that very same tissue culture model that had identified the combination in the first place. I then wanted to go full Monty. It was time now for us to not only show that we could predict and correlate, but that we could use this model to identify patients who would otherwise die of cancer, take surgical biopsies out of patients, and place those surgical biopsies into the tissue culture environment and study drugs and combinations so as to prospectively select treatment, not correlate, not observe, but choose treatments. And using this approach in a particularly difficult disease, metastatic lung cancer, we took surgical biopsies of patients out of the patients, studied them in the laboratory model, developed uh, treatment recommendations and provided them to our clinicians, our colleagues working with us on the, on the clinical side. And we gave them the best regimens that we could recommend. Using this approach, as we reported in 2012, we were able to provide a twofold improvement in objective response and a 50% improvement in progression-free survival. Not only that, but there are patients who I accrued to that study who are alive today, 14 years later. Here's our most recent correlative study, and I'll point your attention to the top curves. This is a paper I published uh, in October 21, just a year ago. And this was again a prospective study, again in ovarian cancer where we took patients and examined their outcomes in a standard treatment setting using our laboratory model, A, to select platinum sensitivity and resistance, the principal determinant of survival. Now, along the top three curves, you can see that the tissue culture correlates clearly statistically significantly were associated with progression-free, disease-free, and overall survival based on the tissue culture studies prospectively evaluated. At the bottom, an even more interesting aspect of this study is our metabolic signatures using mass spectrometry, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So here we had another example, a more recent prospective example of the predictive validity of the model. So I think that with this, we can say that, that the Nagorno Cancer Institute in Rational Therapeutics has conducted an adequate collection of data to prove the point, we've conducted 11,600 individual patient studies in our CLIA approved reference laboratory. Although prostate cancer is unfortunately not an easy one to study, as you might imagine, most patients have surgery and don't need chemotherapy. Patients who recur have radiation and don't need chemotherapy. And patients who then recur often have bone metastasis, which is a difficult model for us. It's not easy to get adequate tissue. So prostate cancer, unfortunately, has not been a model that we have tested extensively, but we've done almost 150 prostates over the years to examine novel treatments, some of which have been profoundly effective. More to the point, we have peer-reviewed published results in leukemia, breast, ovary, lung cancers, and other cancers. And in a meta-analysis of our data, in 2,581 clinical outcomes in the peer-reviewed literature, 
we will provide a 2.044 higher objective response rate, P.001, and a 1.44 higher one-year survival, P.02. So I think we can, we can say as a given that this laboratory model is proven and works. So we move now to prostate cancer. The target of today's discussion and an area of great interest to the many thousands of men who confront this every year. Now, when we look at prostate cancer, which had been the poor relation of cancer research for many years until Coffey's work, really groundbreaking work about 20 or 25 years ago at, at, at Johns Hopkins. I, I really is a hero in this field. He was the first guy to take prostate cancer seriously. In any case, what we now know is that prostate cancer isn't just prostate cancer, but it is a sort of varied population of different tumors, different uh, 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 features. And we have tended once again to return to the genomics of this disease. So we will look at actionable targets as we know them. Among the most common and the most common fusion is the TNPRSS2 ERG. That's been studied extensively. Thus far has not yielded to a lot of therapeutics, but it is a, a very good diagnostic finding that confirms prostate cancer and is a common finding. More to the point, however, and what becomes more interesting is as we delve into the genomic profiles of this disease, we begin to see potentially actionable findings, P10, the phosphatase tensin homolog, P10 is indeed a target. Not only is P10 uh, uh, responsible uh, for some uh, changes that may lead to immunologic therapeutics, but P10 is part and parcel of the insulin-like signaling pathway, insulin and insulin -like growth factor signaling pathway through phosphonosyl kinase to AKT, mTOR, and on to metabolic signaling. And that's a point of great interest because metabolic signaling will be a point I'll discuss in a moment. TP53, we reported last year at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, our work with small molecules that influence the upregulation of TP53. And we are currently actively involved in examining and will be publishing our observations in TP53 targeting. And, it, and not insignificant percentage of men with prostate cancer carry P53 mutation, I'm treating a very uh, uh, advanced prostate cancer who's P53 positive right now. And we think in the future we'll have uh, drugs that will target this either directly, such as the uh, chemical compound APR246 that reconfigures activity by structurally altering the cysteine residues of the protein, but also CoD2 and other downstream regulators. RB1, a principal tumor suppressor that is also mutated in this disease, may be a target by virtue of its uh, regulation of cell cycle and the possibility that patients who carry RB1 abnormalities may have a more active cycling, higher KI-67s, and, and possibly more sensitivity to the conventional chemotherapies. And then finally, MYC, the, the chromosome 8Q24 amplification. This is perhaps my most interesting target. And we've written and examined MYC for many years, using mostly, since there is no drug for MYC, and OMOMIC was a failure. Um, we have principally examined the uh, bromo domains. These are, these are small molecules that influence uh, um, epigenetic regulation and influence MYC. Uh, we are very interested in MYC and actually started a biotech company, Metabolomics, which is spelled with a Y, and that is going to be a focus of our work ongoing. Now, um, the other area which has become quite interesting is DNA damage repair. Turns out that 20 to 30% of prostate cancer patients carry DNA damage repair. Now that's very interesting because DNA damage repair not only predisposes to cancer and cancer uh, um, origin, but also becomes a target. So the most common, uh, the homologous DNA repair uh, is the BRCA2, which is found in a small percentage, but a very uh, actionable percentage of patients with prostate cancer. And I have a very interesting story. I had a patient who came to me with highly aggressive prostate cancer has been treated extensively with everything imaginable. When he first came to me with, with uh, advanced disease, my first response was to take him off all treatment and he had nearly four year remission on nothing. Once he recurred, we did a retroperitoneal biopsy and surprisingly found exquisite sensitivity to platinum. I subsequently screened him at a genetic level and he was BRCA2 and he had a multi-year response to basic, to platinum and PARP mediated therapies. 
That was long before the current literature or the approval of PARP inhibitors in these diseases. I was basically borrowing my breast cancer patients' drugs and giving them to him. ATM and the ATR pathway or DNA damage response, mismatch repair, well-established in Lynch syndrome. BRIP1, which is part of the BRCA family as are related to the FANC genes. And then finally, CDK12, which is an epigenetic regulator of DNA damage repair. It's important, however, as we look at the genomics and even transcriptomics of this disease, that it isn't enough to identify a target. There are many, many, many scientists and many, many clinicians today who are identifying targets left and right. They're using uh, the commercial laboratories, the foundations, and the, and the uh, signataras, and the carices, and the neogenomics, and the tempuses to identify targets. The trouble is that most of the time you either don't find a target or the putative agent used for that target, unless it's highly selective, like a matinib or CML, mo most of the time these are polygenic events and the target identified at a genomic level is not actually actionable in a clinical level. So it is not enough to identify a target. You have to be able to hit it. And to hit a target, you need a model, a method, that delves more deeply, more granularly into human biology, and that's human primary culture. And with appropriately studied primary culture, you can take a target to a win. So appropriately conducted human tumor primary culture analyses will guide treatments from target to response, will eliminate the guesswork in most contemporary clinical trials, will serve as a conduit from concept to clinical therapy, and provide the basis for the next generation of metabolism-based therapies. And I'd like to just finish with a little discussion of where we think we're going. Remember, the human phenotype, that poor relation of genomics, that, that uh, oft uh, maligned area of investigation will surpass all of the genomic and transcriptomic fields because phenotype is human biology. And the ultimate <clears throat> measure of phenotype is metabolism and metabolomics. We know now that all cancer cells require glucose for energy and cell structure, lipids for energy and membrane structure, and amino acids for energy and protein structure. Cancer is a metabolic disease. We can now use, and in my laboratory over the stall, a SIAC 6500 IVD triple quad mass spectrometer. We are now measuring tissue culture and plasma metabolism. We reported at AACR this past year on the use of tissue culture metabolism as a predictor of response and showed with extraordinary accuracy that we could tell which patients would go into complete remission based on the microenvironmental metabolism of their tissue culture. Really, I think a fascinating observation. Anyway, human tissue, human uh, plasma can be used to gauge metabolism. We can study how cells are making and using energy, the ultimate measure of phenotype. So I'd like to finish by showing you some data that we've generated over the last years Metabolomic analyses of prostate cancer plasma, these are patients who were studied over years, using targeted mass spectrometry. Now I'll explain what mass spectrometry is. Mass spectrometry takes plasma or other body fluids, adsorbs them to a matrix, and then sends these little particulate matters through a uh, electromagnetic field, and they all land on a television screen, as it were. And the television screen tells you whether it's uh, large or small, whether it's charged or not. And you can tell what you've got in the plasma. You can measure. Now, the breakthrough for us has been using targeted or deuterated mass spectrometry. What we now do is we don't just find it. We don't just say you've got glutamate. We can measure how much glutamate you've got. So I'd like to show you data that I think is stunning and I think will lead the way to really new breakthroughs. These are lipidomic ratios. Lipidomic ratios are fats. Your bloodstream, when you eat an ice cream cone, 
if you take the blood out, you've got a lipid layer, and that lipid layer is rich in different lipids. There's so many, you know, adipic and, and palmitic. And there are also um, fatty acids that are uh, combined into uh, structures known as um, phosphatidylcholine. So this is a algorithm that we developed measuring phosphatidylcholines. Phosphatidylcholines are just fats. They're in the blood. But I'd like to point out what this is telling you. Here are a group of men with normal PSAs. Okay? On the left, the control group, the normal group, have a PSA of 1.8. And right next to them are prostate cancer patients who also have a PSA of 1.8. But the ratio of these lipids tells you who's who. That is, the normal PSA can be distinguished into cancer or no cancer based on how the cells are making or using energy. Similarly, the group with a PSA of 2.5, the controls versus the patients with cancer, you can distinguish the normal PSA group who don't have cancer from the normal PSA group who do have cancer based on how they make and use energy. And finally, in the group with 3.9, again, remember under that magic number of four, still normal PSAs, the people who have a metabolic signature that suggests that underlying this normal PSA is a cancer in the making. So analyses conducted our, at our institute now and reported are using the ultimate measure of phenotype metabolism for diagnosis, prognosis, and prediction of response, as we have now shown in breast, ovary, and other cancers. We think that moving from genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics to phenotypic metabolomics, the future will be bright. Thank you. I'll take questions. Uh, <clears throat> Rick's, Rick's applauding. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nagorni. Um, just a quick question. Are you, do you have a hard stop at the hour or can you run over and all? No, sorry. no, no. No, I have you do. Okay, great. Then we'll keep it kind of open-ended. And I'll selfishly, I've got three questions, and I'll just selfishly ask one before everyone else gets started. And everyone else, if you can use the hand raising feature, then I'll call on you and moderate the discussion. Um, I guess there, the, 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 I'll just start with one of the three questions I had, which was sort of access um, and logistics. Um, so the input that the kind of testing that you are doing on tumor tissue is fresh tissue. And uh, that then uh, requires fresh tissue. And many of the prostate cancer patients had an original biopsy and it's been stored in FFP, but they often don't have fresh tissue. And so now maybe they've gone through lines of treatment and they've got a low PSA and so there's no, no tissue to biopsy. So how logistically, how do you work with patients to get, and you said this was a problem in prostate cancer, how do you work with patients to get the kind of tissue that is needed for the input to the testing that you do? Well, it's a good question. And unfortunately you're right, in prostate cancer, it is problematic. We try to, uh, we try to offer our services in patients who we feel need it. For example, I have a young woman who's desperate to come to see me in second opinion. She has a small estrogen receptor positive, low grade breast cancer. And I said, don't come see me. There's no reason. You'll have a surgical procedure. You'll have a lumpectomy. There's no one's going to recommend chemotherapy. So that's a patient who doesn't need me. However, if she had triple negative or HER2 positive disease, yes, I would consider, I would consider uh, uh, recommending it. Similarly, luckily, fortunately, with PSA and appropriate um, uh, PIRAD, we now know when patients who present with prostate cancer can likely, hopefully, be cured with, um, with surgery and or radiation and hormones and don't need me. My, my role in prostate is really for the more advanced disease. Or I, I, you know, and I guess if someone's going to prostatectomy, like I generally don't feel very comfortable with patients with Gleason 9s having surgery. I find that there's such a high recurrence rate. So if someone said to me, I've got a Gleason 9 and the surgeon wants to remove it, yeah, I'd say send me a piece of that because you know very often there's a need for some form of chemotherapy or other drugs. The other population are people who have soft tissue or, or nodal disease. And, I, and again, I of all the thousands of studies I've done, I've only done hundreds of prostates for these very reasons. So you're right, prostate has not been 
has not been the best uh, model for us. And I, that may be good news, bad news. But but at this point, uh, it's not an easy disease for us to study unless someone says, I want to know this. And when I have the prospective in my Gleason 7, I'll send it and wait on it. One thing I can say is that if a patient does not receive intervening therapy, the patient is not, um, I think someone may have hit share screen there, but uh, if a patient is not uh, receiving therapy, the assay results will largely remain extant over years. We've shown people serially studied who do not get intervening chemotherapy and their patterns of sensitivity remain similar. So I guess one option is if someone wanted to, they could say, okay, I'm having my prostatectomy, I'll send it and we'll sit on the data till I need it. But but you're right, it is problematic. Okay, so let me cue Brian there because Brian has got getting tissue. And then there's a second question I was gonna raise, but that's one of my questions, but actually Brian's the best one to make it, which is I have a very skeptical, the, the setup is I have a very skeptical treating physician to anything that's ex vivo or in vitro um, I'm not sure that it, you know, yields results. So that making that argument, but I'll let Brian both talk to you seem to be a candidate because you have the right quantity of fresh tissue access. And then the second question, question about how to overcome uh, physician skepticism about getting the results from these tests. Yeah, thank you, Brad. So uh, Dr. Nagurney, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, really phenomenal to hear how you're thinking differently about this disease. And uh, I, as a patient, I appreciate that. Um, as Brad mentions, I'm a six year, you know, uh, cancer survivor, been through multiple lines of treatment. What is interesting about my cancer is that it is uh, soft tissue only, uh, and it is actually locally contained within uh, my pelvic region uh, near the uh, peritoneum. I'm about ready to go, undergo uh, my third surgery. Uh, on November 7th. And from that, I want to be able to get the best diagnostics I can possibly get because the chances of the doctor getting all of it through surgery are pretty much slim to none. I mean, I've got microscopic, microscopic disease. I have Gleason 9, so I have aggressive cancer. Um, I am failing abiraterone right now. And so I guess the question is, you know, Am I a good candidate to take advantage of, for example, your mass spec uh, technology? If I am, uh, how do I uh, how do I work with you to make sure that I get you the right kind of tissue that can be leveraged for your platforms? Mm. Well, first of all, I'm so sorry to learn of your plight. You look young for this uh, problem. Um, yeah, I think that if you run up against resistance. I think you have on the on the um, phone call some people from Latai's laboratory, Dana Farber. I think what you might want to say to your doctor: Where are you located? I'm at UC. I'm uh, UCSD, San Diego. So I'm. Hop, so you might want jump. to point out to the doctor UCSD that that the group at Dana Farber seem to think differently. Maybe they ought to start catching up. Anyway, on. Um, the issue here is that yes, we'd be happy to test you, and if you would like to take advantage of our. Uh, approach. If you'd like to, it's free. We would run your plasma. You have to come fasting and we will characterize your, your biochemistry. And thirdly, when we conduct, if we do get a tissue sample from you, we will run your tissue culture, microenvironmental um, metabolomics. So I will do all that and that doesn't cost you a dime. My laboratory test, and I don't know how old you are if you're Medicare, my laboratory test may or may not be covered. There will come a time when people will wake up and start paying for this stuff. It's very cost effective, but that's also a problem with insurers. The point being that if you have tissue that can be submitted to us, it's a cinch to get it to us by either overnight courier or either directly. If you're in San Diego area then? Yeah. Oh, then that's, that should be easy. Just out of curiosity, where where is the disease? Retroperitoneal or where do you have disease? Yeah, it's 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 in the it's in the peritoneum, uh, just anterior to the uh, to the bladder. Okay, okay. And they're doing the surgery for the purpose of of surgical cytoreduction reduction or for cure. What is the intent here? Really debulking, right? Okay. So you know, yeah, it's it's getting you know at a pretty decent size, um, and I've got. Really, you know, two known lesions. There's that one, and then there's one that's um, just in a spot, um, just um, adjacent to it. So, but I what, know that I have. I've also got microscopic disease as well. What what volume of what kind of like how many centimeter lesions do you have that they're going to be resecting? Do you know? 
Yeah, it's a it's about uh, four to five centimeters. Oh, uh, that's. I mean, that's a ton. That's a ton. Yeah, could test every drug known to mankind. So I mean, exactly. if they're willing, if they're willing to part with that, on, um, I mean, if they're not, come up to Irvine, and we'll do it. Yeah. Because I, I think yeah. really patients can't take prisoners anymore. You know, your life hangs in the balance. The doctor has a bias. You know, the earth right. is not flat. We have to move beyond contemporary clinical therapeutics, which which are not providing. It would be one thing if your doctor could say, well, of course I can cure you. But your doctor knows only too well that you're confronting a very difficult problem. And I don't want to overstate what I can do. I don't want to say like, oh, yeah, I've got the curative therapies. I don't. I don't. What I have is a better approach. And the problem in modern science is that perfect is the enemy of good. And you want good because right now you've got bad. Cancer therapies today consist of docetaxel and cabazitaxel. If you're lucky, you'll pop up some sort of genomic profile that might, might render you a candidate for a targeted approach. There's a group out of UCSD who are using that, I think not very effectively, although they're selling it, using the concept that they can craft gene-driven therapies based on multiple drugs combining to affect. I've yet to see my first response from that approach, but it doesn't keep them from selling it. Anyway, the, the point being that human tissue is complicated. And in order to gauge what drugs will work, you have to ask the cancer. You can't ask their grandparents and what genes they've got and all that sort of thing. You've really got to ask at a functional level. And I think, you know, refreshingly, we've seen the best scientists in the world are waking up to this, that human tissue is so complicated that we just can't guess any longer. And we also can't use these platforms. You know, I was using that pick a number. We have a tendency to make cancer cells behave according to our dictates. We'd better learn some humility. Cancer is very complicated. And if we're going to fix this, we have to listen very carefully to what the tumor is telling us. Now, I'd be happy to help you. We'd look at drugs and combinations and do our best. And, and I wish you every success, whether we work with you or not. I hope you ever, uh, you really do well with this. I, I'm, I'm sorry to learn of your problem, but we'll help you if we can. Awesome. And then just one, um, one so fresh frozen tissue, tissue is fine. No, no, fresh sterile, no frozen, nothing. No, no frozen. Kidney. Okay. It's like, a, it's like a kidney for transplantation. Okay. And, I'll follow, and transport. I'll follow up with, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll follow listen, with, if you want to do this, you can reach me and we'll walk yeah. you through this. And exactly. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps okay, the cool. surgery could be done uh, under your care rather than UC San Diego. Would that yes. be preferable? Well, I, I would prefer not to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't like to disrupt patients' working relationships, but if the doctor is that much of a, uh, you know, that's a stick in the mud, then yes, we'll do it. Okay. I have I have sent patients down to Robert at Long Beach when I run up into um, arrogance, you might say, up in the San, in the Bay Area, up in San Francisco, and uh, it's great. Uh, He's got the team down there. This he gets it gets done really fast. Gets done right. You know the cells are going to be fresh, so it's definitely an option. Um, he will take cells from anywhere in the world uh, if they arrive the next day overnight express. But you, there's a chance of losing viability uh, when you're shipping at long distances. But it's not limited to just California. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll I'll follow up with you uh, offline, Dr. Nagurney. Sure. Fine. Happy to help you. Yeah, I think it, we should say that one of the Brian could have had radiation on his lesions, but he chose surgery so that he could surplus tissue so that he could have this kind of test. So that's a factor in his decision to use surgery over radiation. At one point, yeah. Brian, you want to be sure you do run every platform, as, as, as John will tell you. We want all, we need all the help we can get. So we would yeah. love to have genomic transcriptomic proteomic analysis. I'm not demeaning their role. I'm just saying that they're part of the picture. We want everything. Okay, cool. I, I've got a separate thing I'm pursuing with Wild Cornell where they're uh, integrating uh, WGS with RNA and they're uh, integrating uh, organoids into this as well. I'd be happy to send I know you their work. I know the, their work. the protocol on it. Um, it came to, anyway, um, so I do plan to do that as well. Um, and maybe it would be complimentary to what you would be doing with mass spec. Brian also has some core biopsies that he just had 
uh, needle needle biopsies that he just did recently. But those yeah. could be sent. Those could be sent for other platforms. You might want to use those now. And in fact, if you get those in advance, we'll know what small molecules to throw in the mix. Right. Okay. And he also he's gone through extensive cure matching uh, consultations and has what twenty. What, what's your list now, Brian? 20? I think it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've got like 21 different uh, treatment options. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah. some of them are, are targeted. Some of them are standard of care, uh, various different approaches. Uh, but what I'm also finding is that my cancer is morphing. So uh, I formerly had uh, Tempiserg for uh, the better part of five years and just ran some uh, DNA seq and that's gone, which is fascinating. Huh. And just Brian, Brian, could you pick up the second question about um, influencing your primary treating physician to consider results from ex vivo or in vitro uh, tests? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Dr. Nagurni, I, I know that you've you've been down this path quite a bit, you know, but certainly I've spoken to um, you know my care team about ex vivo. I've also spoken to um, you know, doctors, a part of the um, Prostate Cancer Foundation, who really cast doubt on, uh, you know, ex vivo uh, testing and are not supporters of it. And it, it's as a patient, it's it's difficult sometimes to kind of like push through that. So that's certainly been my experience. Wait ten years. Yeah. Well, I need to get I need to get there. That's the point. <laughs> so, that's yeah. the point. You don't yeah. have time for them to catch up. Your life hangs right. in the balance. Do what yeah. you need. They'll get yeah. there. You know, it yeah. took Christopher Columbus 20 years to get three small ships to discover the new world. Okay. And so he said that those that see, that see the light before others must follow that light despite others. Do you need this help? And it can help you. Your doctor isn't dying of cancer. You are. Yeah. You know, the other thing, too, is that and, and we talk about this a lot, is that the consultative visits are so much more about treatments as opposed to understanding the cancer. You know, my background is in, you know, personalized mar marketing, building personalized experiences for consumers. You can't build a personalized experience for a consumer unless you know a lot about them. Very data driven, using multiple uh, different data sets to understand that consumer. Yet in this field, I find that the paradigm is completely reversed where it's, I've got, a, you know, I've got a set of solutions for you and we're going to try to, you know, fit you into one of these solutions, not knowing what is the best solution for you. It's very frustrating, quite frankly. And the other, the other point too is like, don't give me a drug that's not going to work for me. You know, I don't want to be subjected to some level of toxicity that, um, that I just don't need, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, it, it is frustrating as a patient, uh, particularly um, trying to build diagnostic strategies with my, clarity, uh, my care team. We just need to change that entire paradigm. You know, it's 80% on treatments, 20% on diagnostics at best, that whole thing needs to flip. No, I agree with you. Uh, what happens is when you go to see particularly academic physicians, Instead of them saying, what can I do for you? You feel as if they're saying, what can you do for me? Yeah. And, and I, I remember I used to give a lecture and we were looking at data at the time, phase two trials, 163 patients had been treated with a drug and there had not been a single response. What do you say that at 164th patient regarding their chances with this drug? I mean, doctors have to take, to, you know, participate in, in the process. It's not just a scientific pursuit. It's a very human experience. And that's why we do what we do, because every patient is their own story in real time. And they're not a, a you know a, a clinical trial candidate. And I don't do clinical trials anymore. I used to, but uh, the only trials I'll do are tissue assay trials. I, I would never accrue someone to something. I just can't do it anymore. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. That's, that's the right perspective coming from my six years of experience with this. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna yield the floor. I'm mm. gonna follow up with you offline, sure. uh, get some specifics in terms of how to, how to uh, get the, the tissue to you. Thank you.
Okay, Carrie has raised her hand. Carrie. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nagarni and Brian and Brad. Um, yeah, to that last point, this is uh, the idea of the patient needs to be in charge of what they need and the 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 support community, which are the healthcare providers, need to be attuned to that. I'm all on board, as everybody knows. I've talked about that myself. And I'm wondering, and I posed this question recently. I'm on a, I'm on a committee at UCSF representing the patient needs. Um, and I posed this question just on Saturday, which is asking, what is the obligation of oncologists to inform patients about diagnostics and treatment options outside those offered by their own institution? And the question I got, or the answer I got back was related to guidelines and standard of care, that there's a duty to inform, but beyond that, it's a judgment call. And to, you know, to amplify Brian's point, I, I've seen this for over a decade now, and I'm wondering what your position is as a physician for what do you think physician, the physician community can do to inspire and motivate other healthcare practitioners to take seriously their need to inform beyond what an institution has on offer? The, the fact is that um, doctors should realize that they work for the patient. Right, the patient hires the doctor to do something for them. It's not the other way around. And what I say to patients is, it doesn't matter who treats you. What matters is that you get the right thing. And that's why I don't. I only take on patients who are genuinely really in trouble. I mean, I would take on an advanced prostate cancer with soft tissue disease. I have a patient who came to visit me uh, with uh, coming up on five years with ALK positive lung cancer. I will assume her care because nobody, Johns Hopkins and Dana Farber and MD Anderson and UCSF, sorry to say, don't know what to do with her. So I'll take her on. But I, I, I really take on people who need what I do above and beyond what anyone else can offer. And I like to keep people in their own homes and in their own environments. I will occasionally have people come to see me for a biopsy. But the job of the doctor is to get the best outcome, not keep the patient. And clinicians and many academics tend to find themselves in a situation where they want they want to keep the patient, even if it isn't necessarily in the patient's best interest. So what I do very often is we'll do studies. I had, I had very interesting experience. I had a patient who was a doctor, a colleague. He was a, a, a primary care physician who's working in an urgent care in Orange, Orange County, and he developed a rare form of kidney cancer. He came to me, very large volume disease, and we did a study. And interestingly, years ago, we found a signal unexpected in a small molecule. So I tried, I puzzled over it. You know, I was wondering why would this be? And then I came to realize, I dug into the tumor and I realized that this rare form of kidney cancer was often driven by CMET, M-E-T, the gene. So I thought, wow, this guy's got a CMET driven tumor. So I said, well, let's get this guy in a CMET trials. So I called up UCLA guy named Lee Rosen and he was just doing an arcule study and he just closed a cruel. So I found that, that the Carmanos Cancer Center was treating with this CMET targeting, and it was a Sujin compound, it was uh, developing into a trauma. So I sent him to Detroit, uh, and, and the phase one trialist took him on as the trial, and he responded durably. And years later, I ran into her at an ACRM, very, uh, Patricia LaRusso, now at Yale, famous. And I said, Patricia, do you remember that patient? Oh yes, he was my best response. I said, well, you know why he responded? <laughs> because we chose him for you. He didn't just go to you, we sent him to you. So the point is our job as a doctor is to get the best outcome. The patients that come to me, I regularly send them elsewhere. I said, get other opinions. Mine just one opinion, but my opinion may hold some weight because we try to use the patient's tissue to make the decision. I, I'd like to think I'm a smart guy, but I'm not nearly smart enough to figure out what to do with complex cancer patients. That's why I cheat and I interrogate their tumors. I torture their tumors until they confess. And that's <laughs> what doctors have to do. They have to, they have to, they have to be humble. You know, there was a book written by Eric Topols located in San Diego at La Jolla. And the book was about physician, uh, patients becoming very sophisticated and that they now know better than their doctors, which sometimes is true, what to do. So the book was entitled the patient will see you now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was one, one of my first books on my cancer journey. It was a great book. 
<laughs> I have I have one follow up question to make your your information maximally actionable. I've heard there's been some changes in the um, the reimbursement landscape for consultations for interprofessional consults. Do you see that improving anytime soon, or what are ways around that so that physicians know they can get they can be incentivized to actually seek outside help or refer? Do you mean uh, like telemedicine sorts of things, or how do you how do you mean that? Consults meaning interprofessional consultations, where a physician will actually loop in someone from another institution in order to know maybe who to refer to, for example. Interesting. Not telemedicine well, yeah. to a patient, but for consults. Interesting. Yeah, I, th that I'm not so familiar with. As John uh, Laird will tell you, I, I really, I'm a clinician, and I'm trying to save lives, and I've been working hard in this field for a long time. And my, you know, I'm not a very good businessman. So if John or someone calls me and wants an opinion, I just give it to them. I mean, I just want, I want to see that these patients get the best outcome. As I said, my father had prostate cancer and I, and I greatly appreciated my ability to ask my colleagues opinions at the time. And, and Basil Casimus, who was the director of the ECOG program, year after year at ASCO meetings would always help advise me on what to do. He never charged me. And then, I mean, you know, in a, in a way, I think doctors, there was a study done in the New England Journal of Medicine. They said that almost all doctors continue to give other doctors uh, free advice. And I, I mean, I'm, if a doctor needs my input, I'll, I always take doctor calls. And in this case, unfortunately, imagine the scenario for the person who has the question. Maybe the, maybe the physician on the other end is willing to provide their opinion, but what, what incentivizes the physician who's the patient's current treating physician to actually reach out and have their time reimbursed? That seems to be the crux of the issue. I, well, I am beyond my pay scale to figure out policy. I think that medicine has really gotten goofed up and all the reimbursement issues have gotten in the way of good medicine. Uh, and I, as I said, I will often donate my time. If a physician needs my advice on something and wants to approach me, I'll talk to them. Thank you so much. I've 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 had um, doctors that I've uh, and that usually it's a patient request, but I say let's let's have your doctor talk to Dr. Nagorni about the results. Um, and some physicians are willing to do that, and some aren't. And you know, if they wanted a debate about the findings, it'd be an unfair fight because I think Dr. Nagorni would be able to conclusively show that using the information he gets would be in, you know, to the advantage of the patient. But um, I've actually never had that develop, devolve into reimbursement issues. It's just like, if you want to help your patient, talk to Dr. Nagorni. And some will and some won't. Uh, Rick, you have a couple questions. Yeah, um, this is a kind of a selfish question, uh, but can you help me kind of thing? I have nodal disease, uh, TMP, RSS, ERK, and CDK <clears throat> mutation or fusion and mutation were identified in uh, my genomics. Uh, I express uh, highly AR <clears throat> and uh, just wondered if uh, you could help me because like Brian and like Eric were, you know, like you said we're concerned beyond concerned and uh since i have a i guess a nodal disease would i be a candidate for your care uh, we will test anyone that can provide us a cubic centimeter of tissue uh tell me are you cdk12 is that what you're yes okay there are a lot of cycles <clears throat> on um, yeah i mean we test play with pure which is a cdk inhibitor uh, if we were to see significant activity, we would probably look to find a clinical trial that was using one of the newer small molecules targeting CDK. There are several under, under investigation. Um, you know, the interesting thing about, about cancer um, is that the gene profiles characterize features of the disease, but don't necessarily tell you what to use for them. Like, for example, in, in, the, in the rare exception of a CML with a matinib or an ALK with a lectinib or, you know, an EGFR a TKI with osimertinib, these constitute small percentages of the diseases. Most of these diseases are polygenic. 
So it really is a combination of a metabolic alteration, the DNA damage repair change, and androgen receptor changes. By the way, you probably realize that DNA damage repair directly connects, interestingly, to androgen signaling. I mean, something that, that many people didn't realize, androgen signaling alters DNA damage repair. And it's not surprising, really. I mean, if you think about cancer, I think if we're going to cure this disease, we're going to need to reverse engineer our thinking about cancer. Cancer is not a gene or a mutation or an amplification or a fusion. Cancer is a cell that found in its deepest reaches of its pocket something that was advantageous. And that allowed it to do what it's doing to you. Now, the CDK12 or the interaction between CDK12 and your androgen receptor, all being the case, that may mean that the cell is, is particularly sensitive to an epigenetic regulator and you could get uh, 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 test metastat, EZH2 inhibitor. You could look at Saha and related HDAC inhibitors. You could look at deoxyazocyte and azocytidine as DNA methyl transferase inhibitors. So, I mean, these give you sort of general ideas as to what pathway, what direction, what truncal mutation led to the process, but that doesn't always connect to the drug, the treatment. Yeah. And so as much as I'd like <clears throat> to say that looking at a genomic or a transcriptomic profile tells us what to do, it's the sort of deus ex machina, it's the ghost in the machine. It's the sort of intangible that drives tumors because ultimately all they really want to do is stay alive and we're trying to kill them. Thanks. Uh, should um, my nodal disease become uh, uh, able to resect, I will definitely uh, sure. reach out. Again, we try to avoid invasive procedures. We, we want to help people without hurting them. So if someone right. is going to surgery, by all means, send us tissue. If someone's mm -hmm. going to have a prostatectomy and wants to know what to do with their Gleason 9, send us tissue. But we wouldn't, we don't generally recommend having surgeries that may be, you know, difficult for you. I, I don't like to put you through. Right, right. We'd love to study it, but we don't want to do it at some cost to you. I will tell you an interesting story. I had a patient who called me. He was a physician from Hawaii, and he had recurrent metastatic disease. And um, he said he was going to have a prostatectomy. And I said, that's insanity. You don't want a prostatectomy. You were going to have disease. The horse out of the barn. It's crazy. He said, no, no, I want to get your tissue. I said, I really, I did everything to talk him out of it. And he did it anyway. And lo and behold, he had exquisite sensitivity to platinum-based therapy that no one had ever given him. And it turned out, unbeknown to me, that he had a DNA damage repair deficiency and had a very good response to a platinum-based therapy. And so I felt guilty that I had dissuaded him because I usually do. I don't like people having big surgeries just for me. I'm just... That's my bias. But every once in a while, and I actually have another story somewhat like this. I had a young woman, 26-year-old from southern Brazil, who came to me who had, a, who had a metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma, which is a hell on wheels tumor. She flew from southern Brazil with her family, insisted that we do an open thoracotomy. I was dead set against it. Dead set. I mean, completely against it. But she insisted, insisted, insisted we did it. And actually, I published the study. This was a patient who turned out to be exquisitely sensitive to fenformin, which is the parent compound of metformin. And she went into a durable remission with a drug used for diabetes and, and lived years. And I, again, thought, looked back on that and felt a little guilty that I had discouraged her from a procedure that saved her life. So I, I mean, I stand to be educated. I will tell you in general, I don't recommend big procedures. But if you did have disease that could be that could be accessed, I of course we'd study you. So, so along those lines, I'm taking metformin recently, and a torvastatin, a, and, a and bunch of and mebendazole and doxycycline. <laughs> For, Sorry, oh, that's care and mebendazole and doxycycline. That's care oncology. There's yeah, a lot. Yeah, I'm not taking the other two. Oh, you'll 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 get there. Uh, there's a lot of repurposed drug interest, and we believe in it. And metformin was a, you know, an eye opener for us. We test fenformin, which is the, the parent compound. But um, but these are, you know, if you think about it, these are metabolic pathways. I mean, what's right. doxycycline? What's atorvastatin? Um, these are drugs. I mean, everyone seems to think that cancer is this uh, gene-driven disease, and I can't say that enough times it's not. 
But if you think about a drug like atorvastatin, you know, this is really interesting. We, we believe, and we test atorvastatin, um, we believe that cholesterol is actually an epiphenomenon and that the body is using the cholesterol hydroxymethyl CoA uh, reductase pathway, which is, the, which is the target of the statins, is using the pathway to generate all the geranols and farnesols so as to conduct signal transduction that cholesterol is just the, the last stop on the train. And so there's an awful lot to be learned from metabolism. Again, I don't want to harp on that too much, but what you're doing is a metabolic approach. The problem, and I don't want to be critical, is that your metabolic approach is, is blindly. You're, you're, you're stumbling into this instead of us, and I don't know if we can, instead of us saying, well, gee, you, you, you need more citrulline or you need more carnitine or you need more whatever. That's where we hope to go. And I don't want to overstate that because we're still in the infancy of developing our metabolic signatures. But we have some, we have some interesting findings that I think ultimately will be not only diagnostic and prognostic, but predictive. Interestingly, just a quick, I worked with Metabolon at data for years at Human Longevity, uh, developing uh, analyses uh, from metabolic signatures. So I'm a big fan. Um, Interesting that you did. Metabolon is one of the early entrants. We, we've been in the field longer than them, but they've uh -huh. been in, oh yeah, no, no, we have uh, over 15 years of metabolic development they're not they're in the we we antedate them but we didn't exist as an entity beyond just scientific research until more recently we started a small startup called metabolomics uh, uh about four years ago and and we mm -hmm. where we've differed from metabolon is that we're entirely interested in targeted as you might imagine medical technology cannot be qualitative it must be quantitative so our approach has been to quantify metabolize and then use algorithms to gauge where pathways have gone awry. And, and, and I think that'll be very productive and, and, and more on that in the future. I need to, I'll, I have a couple more, but I need to let Eric speak. So I'll be uh, letting him go. <laughs> Thank you. So I was gonna follow Rick kind of with my selfish question about myself, if you can help me also. So I'm a, uh... I'm a 50 year old who was just recently diagnosed here in July uh, with stage four uh, cancer. PSA was 156, it, I'm sorry, 146, it's Gleason 10. I have a four by five centimeter tumor that's uh, affixed to the rectum um, and soft tissue involvement. Mm -hmm. One lymph node met, no, no bone mets, right? Um, interesting thing is I, I, I've done some whole exome sequencing through Keras and Emma, who was on this call earlier, I'm not sure if she still is, um, she really found through that research that I have two things. One, I have a check two uh, mutation, and I also have an ALK fusion, um, which apparently is, uh, you've mentioned a couple times here, common in other cancers, but super rare in prostate cancer, all right? Um, so my current thinking was to try and target that ALK, but now, now you've, I guess, got me thinking that maybe there's something more here. So I, I guess my question ultimately is, <laughs> can you help me, right? <laughs> can we talk further, right? Well, well of course, I'd be, I'd be willing to try. You have some very interesting biological features, you know, and one of the things that we ought to realize, you have a check too, you know what that is. Yes. So basically, you have... Um, a, a, a gene profile that will predispose you to the accumulation of genetic aberrancies. You lack the ability to stop cells at G2M so that they go right through the mitotic process and carry with them mutations. See, the body is very, very cautious about not letting mutated and amplified and fusion-driven cells through the mitotic process. And there are two uh, principal levels at which the body does that, G1S and G2M. It turns out that many of the drugs that we use, we didn't know all this, many of the drugs that we use basically induce injury that is readable at the level of G1S or G2M. That's the cell cycle. That's the kind of round, around, around. And so, and so you have sort of a G2M issue. Now, that might predispose you, A, to higher levels of immune uh, 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 signals. So did you run a tumor mutation burden and see what your TMB is? Yeah, it was low also. Low. Part okay. of it. 
Okay. Um, so then the question is, would check two predispose you to drugs that either A, induce injury, DNA damage injury that would lead to cycle arrest, under the right circumstances, and B, would you be a candidate for a PARP inhibitor? I don't know if this has been in discussion, but check two could render you a candidate for PARP inhibitors, and we do test them. On, um, I mean, I would be happy to help you if, if it's something you'd want to do. Where did you have surgery, or what have you done? I have not had surgery, so I've just been on first line hormone ADT hormones, uh, Relugalux and and uh, Abiraterone here for okay. just th just three months. Okay, um, well, that's. Very, so very debating special. surgery, I had, so a couple of surgeons have said, no, we're not going to do it because of the, it's touching the rectum. A couple of surgeries, surgeons had said, well, come back to me. If it has shrunk away from the rectum, maybe we could do surgery. Huh. Huh. Gosh, that's a challenging case. And you're young for this. Um, again, we would not personally urge you to have surgery for our purposes, but if you were to have surgery, yeah. There would be the opportunity to examine some of these possible pathways. For example, PARP inhibitors, we do study those regularly. Uh, interestingly, actually, uh, uh, ATM inhibitors, ATR inhibitors, or maybe combinations of PARP inhibitors, that's something we've begun to look at in BRCA patients. You have a, a kind of uh, second cousin to BRCA, so you've got a kind of, kind of DNA damage repair deficiency. And, and uh, so, so, I mean, at a more novel combinatorial level, there are things you could test. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting you have surgery for me, but if you did have surgery and you would like to explore these sort of novel ideas, um, yeah, we would be very happy to, to do that. If, if you were going to go forward with surgery, please um, follow up with me. So going in, I know your case. So I know what drugs and combination. And actually, I'd love to look at your genomics because that guides us toward what small molecules we might test. Yeah, I guess the other question is so far, I mean, I haven't had a surgeon say, yes, I would do it. Did they need yeah, to see no. more of the scan? So if I didn't have that, my other option is radiation right now right. in terms of like a debulking, but you got me wondering here today, if if it wouldn't be a an option to have a surgery through you simply to get not to remove the whole the whole tumor, but simply to get tissue to do your testing, right? I I, I would look at that. I would look at that. Um, we usually we're cautious. We don't want to put you through anything that you wish you hadn't done. So yeah, we love to get tissue, but we don't like to put people through too much work to get. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm 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 open to that. We had a patient this morning from uh, Arkansas flew in yesterday, uh, day before. And uh, he, uh, he has metastatic uh, colon cancer, and he was at MD Anderson. They offered him some standard care. And he, a young guy, I mean, really young guy. And he said, um, he said no, I, I just don't want to take full Fox standard care. So he flew out here, and we did a, a liver, a, a laparoscopic liver bias. We'll set that up today. So we will do those. But you see, that's an easy, that's a readily accessible laparoscopic biopsy. Pelvic disease is deep. And, and and so I just I, I I want to warn you that we do not we do not sure. move you know aggressively into surgeries if they're going to render you in any way at risk. I understand that, and I guess I'm coming from the mindset of uh, you know not just blindly throwing treatments at it and saying is there a way for me to to figure out what to target as you've been talking about here, right? And yeah. well, and, and so something for me to consider if if that's a possibility, I guess is where I'm looking at right now. Especially Always before up. you modulate it with drugs, which may change uh, the profiles. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll listen. Drugs and, and or radiation, right? Yeah. We're, you know, I, I, when patients ask you questions like this, I tell them that basically in a baseball game, there's a pitcher and there's a catcher. I'm sort of a catcher. So someone's got a pitch to me. If I get a good baseball down the line, I'll, I'll catch it and I'll study it. But I, I, I don't want to go and tell the pitcher what to pitch. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there to get what they can send. I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't like to put surgeons through things they don't feel comfortable doing. And I don't like to put patients through things they're not comfortable doing. If you do have accessible tissue and there's a reason that it can be gotten without causing you harm on my behalf, I do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about ALK fusion and prostate cancer? <laughs> I've never heard of it. 
<laughs> I've never seen it. I mean, we see a lot of ALKs. Do you know what your what the gene pairing is? You know what the it, was, it was DTNB. Huh. That's a reverend. Um, there are about eleven known lung uh, ALK fusions, rearrangements. Um, I'd have to see that. Uh, the more common of them. I mean, if they are uh, active, you know, are very responsive to seritinib and lorlotinib and and crizotinib. I mean, it would be it would be fascinating to see. We keep you know brigantinib and all those drugs in in stock. So I guess if you did ever have surgery and send us a piece, we'd run the ALKs and look at the patterns. Also, in within the ALK are certain subtypes. You know, there's one particular G1202 which is associated with the sensitivity uniquely to lorlatinib. But yeah, I mean, again, we'd be very happy to help if we could. All right, thank you for talking. Um, uh, one, one general thing we should just put into the recording, I don't think it's been covered, is that if um, <clears throat> uh, Robert's lab is doing testing and someone's on chemotherapy, they need to be off chemotherapy for two weeks, uh, right. ideally three in general. My question for you, Robert, is for the guys who are on deprivation therapy, is there the same restriction that they need to no. have a certain kind of window without treatment or no? No, no. We we generally allow patients on non-cytotoxic drugs to continue those. So we would probably confer with the patient or the doctor to know what they're on. For example, a woman who has uh, ER positive breast cancer who's on a hormone therapy and wants to know as time is going on whether chemotherapeutics would work. I don't suggest that they stop their hormones. Similarly, uh, someone who, uh, uh, a, a man with prostate cancer who's been on hormonal deprivation, I, I, don't, I don't worry that much about it. But for someone, for example, a breast cancer patient who's on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, like palbocyclib or abemocyclib, those are cytotoxic. Those, those actually cause cells to die. So we would want to know what drug exposures are extant before we say yay or nay. But yeah, I mean, for hormones, generally not. Uh, for immune therapies, generally not. Okay. Brian. Yeah, so um, Dr. Nagurney, you know, keeping in this um, theme of baseball, um, we have one patient who has gone through bipolar androgen therapy, and I know that there's another patient on this call who is cons who is considering it. The one patient um, that, that took on BAT, uh, he's had advanced prostate cancer for eight years. He's been through, I think, 13 lines of therapy. And in June, his PSA was 300 before he started bipolar androgen therapy. After his first um, round of, of uh, testosterone, his PSA went from 300 to 1.79. And that was in June. And I think now it's like at about five. He's gone through you know a few different cycles of um, of testosterone. I'm just curious if you what you think about bipolar androgen therapy, if you have experience with it, because he's going to be talking it talking about it at the Prostate Cancer Foundation Scientific Retreat uh, coming up next week. Um, from a patient perspective, it has a lot of. Um, it has a lot of uh, upside. Um, for us that are on hormone therapy, it's just not fun, right? Um, if you can get your testosterone back as well as kill the cancer, um, that's kind of like a win-win. And I'm just curious if you're familiar with that and what you think about it. And one other thing, there was radiologic evidence of tumor shrinkage. As oh, well yeah. As yeah, it truly yeah, he had, dramatic. Yeah, he had a PSMA pet before and after, and it was like a dry erase board where there's lesions. He had, you know, lesion on his cranium, his femurs, several, and they shrunk dramatically or went away. Well, um, I think it's entirely consistent with the biology of this disease. And in fact, it really is the underpinnings of intermittent therapy. Conceptually, on-off therapies allow you to reestablish the ecology of the cancer. And in a way, 
these cancers become so good at staying alive without testosterone that the one thing they really no longer are prepared to deal with is testosterone. I mean, they have they have completely climbed out onto the limb of no testosterone. And the analogy I use in this setting, which I think is very apt, has to do with our changing climate. We live in a climate that may be altering in terms of increasing drought, the loss of deciduous trees, the changing landscape. And as time goes on, as one withdraws the water, or in your case, the androgen, certain organisms learn to adapt to a new environment. And as they do, they become accustomed to a lack of water. So as a deciduous forest gives way to a desert, the plants that survive in the desert are very different from the plants that survive in the forest water and other environmental ecology. I mean, I mentioned again and again, the ecology of cancer. So now you've got a, a population of, of organisms, these are cacti, that live very comfortably in a dry environment. How do you kill mm. a cactus? You water it. Mm. So I think this is biologically very reasonable. I told you about a young man who came to me from a very, very good group out of uh, out of uh, LA area, really good group. And this guy had uh, presented with very advanced prostate cancer at a very young age, highly aggressive. And they treated him and treated him. And I mean, I, with the litany of therapies that he received and the vascular agents and the immune therapeutics and the deprivation of every last molecule of testosterone, and he showed up in my office and he had that, he was young, and he had that kind of Pillsbury doughboy skin, like a kind of shiny androgen deprived state. He looked like kind of shiny. He hadn't grown hair on his face in 10 years. And he was, he had this kind of, you know, he would gain weight and trunkal obesity and all the features of androgen deprivation. And his PSA was low, but climbing. And he came to see me with his wife, and I said, well, I know what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to take you off all androgen deprivation, which I did. And he had an almost five-year remission, regained his PSA, tumor, everything went back to normal, and lived beautifully with a normal testosterone for almost five years. This was the same patient I mentioned. When he recurred, and this is something I don't normally do, I sent it to my colleague at UC Irvine, and we did a retroperitoneal lymph node that's actually, I must say, in my younger years, I was more aggressive because I normally don't do that now, but I did in his case. And lo and behold, he was highly sensitive to platinum and he turned out to be BRCA. And he got a PARP inhibitor years before anybody was using them for this disease. And I don't really know what the connection between his androgen responsiveness and his BRCA status was, but all in that mix was a very interesting biology. And he lived many, 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 many years on with treatments that most people wouldn't give. So I do believe that androgen treatment in the right patient could be very effective. It's very frightening to give. It's extremely frightening to give for a doctor. Because, yeah. you know, um, ladies and gentlemen of the court, would you please explain, doctor, you gave this patient with advanced prostate cancer, <laughs> what? You know, he, right, yeah, right. I gave him testosterone. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, but I mean, yeah. It's it's biologically very reasonable. It's just with great trepidation. And I think it's a yeah. very interesting area. Um, I must say that with the exception of withdrawing androgen deprivation, I have I don't think I've actually ever given testosterone in a patient with very, very advanced prostate. In retrospect, I had a very dear friend who died of prostate cancer, and I wish I would have, because he mm -hmm. was a scientist and a doctor, and I think he could have fully understand the implication of what we were trying to do, but I didn't. We talked about it, and I never did it. And I feel now in retrospect, since he did succumb to his illness, why didn't I try it? Which was worse. But yeah, it's 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 a little scary. Yeah. Well, hopefully they're Rick, gonna you... figure out some companion diagnostics that will help to determine who's a good candidate and who's not. I mean, there's some evidence well, that well, if maybe, you have P53 and yeah, well, maybe, uh, maybe no IAR problem. expression. Yeah, Is maybe, that... maybe I, I haven't really thought of that, but maybe we could examine that to a level of metabolism. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was hoping that maybe you'd think about it uh, from that perspective. Okay, cool. 
Yeah, I had two questions. I'll answer, you know, and I know we're on overtime here. Um, I was a big fan of uh, technology such as Akoya and Nanostring, the spatial analysis. Um, and I wanted to know how you felt about that as a first question. And, you know, maybe not so great compared to what seems to be your amazing uh, platform of integration. And then the second one, since you did mention uh, leukemia, uh, we have a very sad uh, three-year-old uh, who just got diagnosed with leukemia. And uh, I believe she's at, at Children's Hospital LA. And I don't, you know, I don't know whether there's anything you would could do or had interest or, so those are my two questions. Well, as we're going the higher level, um, algorithms for the study of uh, genetic signatures. You know, the earliest work in this area was done by a guy named Friend, who began to really figure out ways to better discern what these gen genetic signals were showing. And then um, multi-omics. I did a seminar recently with a group on a rare tumor called fibrolamellar. And uh, we were talking to a guy who runs the bioinformatics program at NIH. And I think that there will be a lot of AI approaches to combining measures of protein and transcriptome and genome into increasingly useful data. The reason I do what I do is we're not there yet and patients need something. But yes, I mean, there may come a time where these higher throughput technologies will, will, will be um, will be able to do what I do. That, that's, I mean, obviously that's, you know, it would be very nice to do a simple needle biopsy and run the proteome and the transcriptome and and the genome and a whole exome, uh, a whole genome and know everything about the tumor. And, and maybe in the future we'll be there. Uh, we're still we're still working on it, but it's, a, it's an attractive target. I, I was really focusing on the spatial aspects. So Akoya takes a tissue slice and they look at, uh, uh, they probe with uh, high-dimensional uh, immunofluorescent probes, you know, get like 30-dimensional uh, readouts on uh, immune, uh, say PDL1 and TIGIT and different immune modulators, uh, and you know, maybe different uh, tumor suppressor uh, readouts. And in a spatial context, mm. so you mm. know, they're really approaching from. Do you have an a uh, characterization of your tumor is are you in an immune desert or are you an immune you do have till infiltration but uh it's uh you know rendered um uh non-effective from pdl1 and that kind of thing so mm -hmm. more of a, there was a spatial question which uh i was championing uh wondered your reaction to the spatial i i'm not I'm not particularly expert in their platform. Um, the uh, I, I I think that that there is a movement of foot. There was a group through the American Association of Cancer Research who are applying sort of a structural and physical analyses. A group at the University of Florida, uh, particularly doing some very interesting work in that area. And I, and I I think that so, that will be productive. I think that will be. Uh, uh, but I, I don't want to overstate my expertise in that particular area. Okay. And the second one was uh, just the, our dear friend's daughter, leukemia. Oh, oh the leukemia. Well, um, you know, I, we would, I would be happy to, 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 to study the, the child. I, I would pre presume this is an acute lipoblastic leukemia in a young woman, is it, girl? Three-year-old. Three-year-old uh -huh. girl, though. Yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, in in childhood ALL, uh, depending on the particulars, uh, pre pre B childhood ALL in a child under ten, female, has an exceedingly high likelihood of cure today, like ninety plus percent. Yeah. So again, as long as this isn't you know a T cell or some variant that uh, I'm missing, I would I would expect that the child would do i mean i hope and believe and, and would expect the child to do well on um, pediatric oncology is its own specialty pediatric oncologists rather jealously guard their patients the reason that we did the study we did that we had a pediatric oncologist on the study with us so it was his patients that we were studying when we did that original study i reported 
But um, I mean, I would I would gladly help this child, particularly if for any reason, which I hope isn't true, 99% of children respond. There's no disease more responsive. So unless I'm missing something, I don't think you'd need me in this case. If that turned out to be the case, call us and I mean, we can get peripheral blood or, or you know, whatever. Sure, I, I'll gladly do it, but I'm hoping and believe you don't need us. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll wrap up with just two quick ones. Uh, one of our favorite things is combinations. And I assume that your testing protocol can handle combinations. It doesn't matter what you're putting on the, the tissue. Oh, uh, I would say the strength, the overwhelming strength of our technology is just that. If you think about it, I mean, there's this group that's using the gene profiles to select drug combinations. They're just doing, they're just doing sort of hopefully intersecting Venn diagrams. We actually can study the drug interactions as I mentioned with the cisgen and stuff. Yeah, I would say the strength of our technology is synergy. Good. And does that and also you, include, rec sorry, Brad, does that also include recommendations in terms of dosing? Because you know, if you get three, three combinations of drugs, I wouldn't imagine it's like, well, a third of a third of a third of, of each drug. You know, how, how, how do you recommend the dosing along with those combinatorials? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I do a lot of multi-drug combinations and a lot of the doctors are completely unfamiliar with them. And so we have not infrequently assumed the care of some of the patients because the doctors, the issue of multi-drug combinations is you need to realize that each drug brings to the table a particular injury. And that if you combine that injury with a second drug or third drug, you, you roll into the mix a combinatorial benefit that doesn't necessarily require high doses. So for example, our work in Cis and Gem, which I mentioned earlier in my lecture, those are all low dose regimens. Those are, those, are, those are mild regimens because the synergy allowed lower dosing. And, and yeah, so we, I agree, but it would, it would take a little conference with the doctor. And we'll often send protocols to people. We'll send them what we've done because I do treat these patients. Great, thank you. My, my last question uh, is on the metabolomics that you mentioned. And I just want to be able to strategically position it relative to other things, like the other things you're doing. Is this, would you think of this as like the latest iteration of the kinds of work you've been doing, or is it a different pipeline entirely? Um, are you still using fresh tissue as the input for the metabolomics, or is it something else? And is this ready for prime time? Also, is this in a research preclinical phase, or is it in a clinical phase? And if it's not in a clinical phase, when will it, you know, so just to give us a sense of the maturity of this and it's kind of readiness for, we have early adopters in our, in our community and they would, they would like lean into this tomorrow. Mm. But, I just, but in many cases, many of the technologies we're looking at are in labs and not really ready for clinical use. So I just wanted to position metabolomics in the pantheon of testing options. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let me explain that the, the uh, origin of the metabolomics work that we're doing really grew out of my interest in phenotype. We were looking at cell biology, we were looking at tissue systems, we, and, and we were looking for a level of greater depth, granularity, in what constitutes the ability of a cell to stay alive. I mean, after all, what we're looking at is, can we kill a cell? Well, how does a cell die? Well, most of the time cells die at the level of the mitochondrion. They, they run out of energy. So I said, well, if they're running out of energy, what is it that gives them the energy to stay alive in the first place? And that's how I, I yeah. rolled over into metabolomics. And some years ago, I said to my colleagues, mostly in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I said, well, why don't we start looking at metabolic signatures? And so what we were doing was we were correlating metabolic signatures with drug response. So, so this patient does or doesn't respond to treatment, and they happen to have a very uh, high uh, uh, kinenurin or you know whatever. So if you'd like, if you're interested in, in, in the paper, we published in Gynecological Oncology a paper that shows drug response and metabolic signature side by side. And so that paper came out last uh, October, and, and I can send you the link. But what we began to realize is over time that A, we could study the microenvironmental metabolism, and that's tissue culture. So if someone sends me a tissue, I will run their cellular microenvironmental metabolism 
Now, I don't report that as a predictor of response yet. I will also run their plasma, which is a global assessment of their metabolism. Very good question, though, because just yesterday, we ran our third of three serial analyses to confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt the reproducibility, precision, and accuracy of the platform that we've been running for years. And we will be going forward in the next month or two to request that we can offer this to patients under our CLIA license. So it's a very good question because right now, if patients are interested and want to do this, we would do it free of charge for them under research protocol. In the coming months, we hope we can offer it as a clinical service. While I'm perfectly happy to discuss what we find until we get the CLIA approval, I can't really formally report it. Like I've got to get sort of the approval to report this, but I will certainly communicate findings. If I said, gee, I think you're in need of more palmitic acid or you're low on steric or whatever, we would report that in a personal communication. But your question is good because I think by the beginning of the year, I'll be able to offer this as a clinical service. I am really excited about that. Great. Is I the final patient? word. Okay, go yeah. ahead. I, I've got some patients I've got to uh, speak with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final. If I don't have tissue to access your platform today, would you recommend the care oncology uh, protocol? I can tell you what the care oncology protocol is. It's doxycycline, uh, statin, uh, metformin, and mebendazole, fipendazole. So save the money and just take them. How about supplements? Uh, you know, supplement, I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly interested in supplements. Uh, the trouble for what we're thinking now is that dietary lifestyle supplement micronutrition macronutrition is probably more personalized than we ever realized so while one person would do very well with fasting the next may not while one person's a great candidate for a ketogenic diet the not the next may not be uh, you know so i'm i i would i'd love to say that there's the right diet but i think it's going to be as individualized as everything else thank you so much